You are listening to a sermon from Village Baptist Church in Petaluma. For more sermons like this one, please visit our website at villagebaptisthome.org. Our mission is to win people to Christ and develop them into active disciples. We pray this sermon is a blessing to you. Now let's hear today's message. What's your favorite season? We are a few weeks away from the end of summer going into fall, and uh, pretty soon the leaves will be changing from green to an orange scarlet. They'll be hitting the floor. Uh, We'll be trading in our shorts and our tank tops for pants and sweaters and uh, soon the smell of uh, pumpkin spice lattes <laughs> will be in the air. <laughs> and it'll be a little bit cooler and we'll start taking trips to the pumpkin patch, trick-or-treating, and ham, and turkey, and cranberry sauce. Oh, look at here, the mmm. Y'all hungry? <laughs> And it will be a great time because fall's a great, I think it's my favorite season. It's a great season. But pretty soon, um, it will start to get even colder. We'll start to see snow on the mountaintops. People will be making trips to Tahoe for skiing and snow, snowboarding. And we'll start to hear Christmas music in the stores and the the streets will begin to light up with Christmas lights. You'll start to see trees and decorations, presents. Winter's here. And before you know it, the bare trees will start to bloom in these bright colors. And it's spring. You know what also is here? Allergies. <laughs> you haven't touched your nose or ear in months, and all of a sudden, <laughs> And spring's here. And then, before you know it, we're back to summer. Because seasons are a part of life. Football season's back. I feel like just that, not that long ago that we were crowning the Bucks the champions, but now teams are getting ready to go into another season, hoping to win the Super Bowl. The Giants are doing really well. And we're hoping that they can continue to do this, have the magic of the 2010, 2012, 2000, was it 14 seasons? Uh, it won't be long before we'll be hearing from the Warriors that they're back in the stadium ready to try and get another championships. Another year is seasons. They're part of life. I don't know if you've reached into your uh, box that you had. You haven't looked in a long time. It has all these old pictures of you, maybe from 25, 30 years ago, and you take out that picture, you look at it, you go, oh my goodness, I was thinner, I had hair, I didn't need glasses, I had no wrinkles, and what was I wearing? I thought I looked so cute, looked like a Power Ranger. And as you're looking at this picture, you're thinking about all the things that you used to be. Oh, man, different times, different season. But also in that picture, you see someone that you were very close to, and your heart is sad. Now you're not close to them. This is a person that you, you don't know what happened. Just one day out of nowhere, they said, I don't like you anymore. Or maybe it wasn't even something like that. Maybe they just moved away. And now that they're in another state, you guys just sort of grew apart. But it could be that you look at that picture and you're sad because that person that you see in the photo is no longer here. See, man, there's something about a photo. It can freeze a moment in time and remind you of different times and just a different season in your life, because life is full of different seasons. 
This passage that we're at here in the book of Ecclesiastes is one of the most famous, it's the most famous passage out of the book of Ecclesiastes. It's his poem about time. You've heard it read at funerals. I'm sure you've read it at a Christian's funeral. You've heard it read at a non-Christian's funeral. It's a very beautiful poem about what it's like to live as a human being here under the sun. And he talks about just what is it look like just to live life. It's a beautiful song. I, I, in researching this week, you know, there's a, a song that was made popular by a group called The Birds in the 60s. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn. A time to be, I don't know. About. That's stuck in my head all week, by the way. You're welcome. That's probably be following you as you leave here. Um, but they just took that from the book of Ecclesiastes. Just a song about life. Now, in the book of Ecclesiastes, what we've been studying is our, our uh, tour guide is a guy called the teacher or the preacher or the Hebrew, he is Koheleth. And he was a very uh, influential man of wisdom and he his is his thesis. He began in the beginning of the book, chapter 1. He said, life is meaningless. It's meaningless. They say, oh, what a happy, chipper guy. Well, what he means by meaningless is the Hebrew word hebel that means it's smoke or mist or vapor. It's that same kind of thing where you take a puff of your cigarette and whew, what you see for a moment and then it's gone. It's like a flickering light. It's there, you know it's on its way out. That's life. And his second point is that there's no gain. You work and 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 then you die. So what's the point of it all? And what he's trying to show us and teach us throughout this book is that to really live, you need to live life in light of the fact that one day you will die. And because that's true, how now shall we live in this world the way that it is? And so in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, look there with me at this uh, wonderful poem. He says, verse 1, there is a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Here, the teacher says this is what it's like to live life under the sun. There's just a time for everything. And what's the thing that he wants to say? This is my one point of two, and I'm going to stay on this point throughout the majority of the sermon. This is what Koheleth wants us to see about the life that we live now under the sun. And his point is this. You and I, we need to acknowledge the sovereignty of God in every season of life. We need to acknowledge the sovereignty of God in every season of life. You never heard that word sovereignty before. Sovereignty just means that he is in control. He rules over everything. And the point that he's making here in this text is that there really is a time and a season for everything. And the teacher, he begins by just saying there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. And between these two poles, everything else happens in the life of a human being. And here, you know what's interesting about these things? You don't have any control over them. They happen to you. It's not like you can go to your calendar and say, huh, I think it's a time to mourn. 
Let's follow what he says. A time to be born and a time to die. Did you choose to be born? Were you standing up there like, yeah, send me on January 6th, 1982. No, you were born. He says a time to plant and a time to uproot. How many of you guys are gardeners? Or you have some plants in your backyard. You know that there's a time to plant and then there's a time to also uproot. That tree that you planted is now diseased or that crop that you planted has been harvested and it's time to lift it up. Here's the thing that you need to be careful about when you read what he's saying here in this text is that he is not giving any commentary. He's just saying this is just life. So he's not taking sides on the different debates about the particulars here, and he's not giving his position about anything. So in verse 3, a time to kill and a time to heal. Be careful He's not saying there is an appropriate time to kill. All the serial killers say, see, there's a time to kill. <laughs> no, he's, if you think about it, there's different words um, that he could have used for the word kill. Um, he could have used another word that would have more accurately been translated murder. It's not the word that he uses. Sometimes you have to defend yourself. Sometimes there's capital punishment. So there's a time in the world that we live in for someone to be killed, but also a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build. This building that we're in right now, one day won't be here. The home that you're in right now, probably one day won't be here. Every time I go to Target or to Chipotle today, it reminds me that probably years and years ago, it's where I was in class in junior high. That's where our junior high school or junior yeah, it's called junior high. Junior high was, in, and every time I'm there, I always remember, I probably was doing PE right here in Chipotle, where I'm at every other day. This is, this is where I enjoy being. There's a time to build, and there's a time to tear down. He said there's a time to weep, and there's a time to laugh. You have to take your firstborn son to college and drop him off and drive away and leave him there. And you weep and then you go home, grab some popcorn, some candy, and watch Netflix and laugh a little bit and cry some more. <laughs> time to weep, time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. May 2013, we buried my grandfather. And a week later, we were dancing at my wedding. It's a time to mourn and time to dance. a time to scatter stones, a time to gather. I'm not sure exactly what he means here, but sometimes enemies, in order to get after somebody, they would put stones into their fields in order to mess up their fields. Maybe he's just talking about gathering stones and then scattering them. We're not really sure, but there's a time to do that as well. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. I think he has COVID in mind here. <laughs> Verse 6, a time to search and a time to give up. What's the best item in the house that's the best at hide and go seek? The TV remote. TV remote, keys. We had a, a remote in our, home, in our room we could not find. It was just gone. And we said, you know what? It's, there's a time to give up. We just let's go find another one. And there might be silly things that you might lose, but there's a time to search maybe for a loved one. And then the heartbreaking moment where you have to give up looking for that loved one. Time to keep and a time to throw away. This is the life verse of my wife and my mom. <laughs> they are professional throwawayers. <laughs> My grandfather, he was gone for something, and he, my mom went to the house to straighten up. And my grandpa came back, and he walked in the house, and he said, Frida was here. <laughs> Where's my couch? <laughs> I mean, she, she loves to throw things away. Don't leave her in the room by herself at your house. 
because she'll throw things away. My wife, she's, we went through, she said, we got to go through your closets. We got to go through your drawers. You have too many shirts. <laughs> so she just went through each one. Throw it away. You don't wear it. Throw it away. You don't wear it. There's a time to keep. There's a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. Maybe tearing it in that culture, they would tear their clothes in um, a funeral or due to grief, and then that same shirt they might have to mend again. A time to be silent and a time to speak. This is a favorite one of parents to their children. There's a time, son, to be quiet, and there's a time to talk. What time is it now? It's time to be quiet. (laughs) It's almost never time to talk, I know. It's a time to love and a time to hate. I didn't think we're supposed to hate anybody. Remember, he's not making any comments about exactly what he's talking about. Hate, the Bible says we are to hate evil. Don't you hate what's happening in Afghanistan right now? So there's there's an appropriateness to hate and appropriateness to love. And there's a time for war and a time for peace. Again, he's not trying to say that he's a pacifist. He's just saying there's a time for war and there's a time for for peace. So when you look at this list, it's just life. And life is full of ups. It's full of downs, times of happiness and grief. It's the great theologian uh, Marvin Gaye who said, let's stay together. Loving you whether, whether times are good or bad, happy or sad. Even he knew In a relationship, in our lives, we have good times, we have bad times. Al Green? Green. I think Marvin Gaye sang it. Did he sing it too? That's not not the point of this sermon. Y'all focusing on the wrong thing right now. We're going to edit that out. (laughs) The great theologian Al Green. <laughs> um, so we all, I mean, we all recognize this. Life is complex. It's not easy to go through life. There are complexities to life. And like I said before, it's not like you can just go in and decide what it is that you want to bring into your life. You know, life is like a, a, a bag of jelly beans, right? You reach in. And sometimes you get red, and sometimes you get purple, sometimes you get green, but sometimes you get black licorice. And we all, we all 99.9% of people understand that black licorice is horrible. Nine out of ten doctors agree it's toxic to our livers, right? <laughs> this, this, you can't reach in and decide what you want out of your life. When you reach into that Halloween bag and you reach in, oh, you got your Snickers, you got your Baby Ruth, you got your Twix, and then there's Almond Joy. Who wants Almond Joy? Or who wants uh, uh, Three Musketeers or the Milky Way? Ooh. We can't look into life and choose what we want as we look in. If we had it our way, we say, oh, laughter, I'll take some of that. Mm hmm. Ooh, I like the dancing. Take that. Die? None of that. Uh, I don't like crying, none of that. Can't do that. Whatever life brings your way, you got to deal with it. This is life under the sun. But here's what we have to understand about the things that come our way, and that is that God is is sovereign. We need to acknowledge that everything that comes to us, good or bad, happy, sad, the good moments, the bad moments, they are all from the hand of God. Nothing comes to us that has not gone across God's desk, and he hasn't put his stamp of approval on it. Nothing. We must believe that if we're going to live in this world, that we're not in a world that's just random. And things happen, and we are just here, and we have to just deal with whatever the random universe gives to us. We acknowledge that God is sovereign over everything. And so every season of your life comes from the hand of God. Every season. 
But we just don't understand. Look at verse 9. He says, what do workers gain from their toil? Remember, he's asked this question already. What is it that we, that we gain? Verse 10, I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Here is the important thing. God is sovereign and in control of everything. And all the things that are part, all the components of life, it says God takes all those moments and he makes them beautiful in their time. Which means that God has a plan for our lives and a plan for the things that enter into, into our lives. The seasons that we deal with, the ups and the downs, God is working something and it is going to be beautiful. So the seasons of our lives are not marked by the sun and by the moon. The seasons of our lives are marked by the relationships that we have and who we are as a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, and as an employee, and we don't have control over those things. And God, he makes things beautiful in his time. And what's difficult is that we can't see the picture that God is painting. Amen. You remember that show, uh, what is it called? The Joy of Painting with Bob Ross. He would, you know, have the little afro. He would get up there in the beginning of the, have this blank canvas and he would have his, his, uh, his paint and he would say, all right. And he would start to paint, and when he started, you're just like, what are you doing? Like, he would just be, you know, putting it here, and yeah, we're just going to put a little yellow on it. Yeah. <laughs> it looks real nice. And you're just like, I don't, I don't see what he's doing. He would go on, and then at some point, as he was painting, you would go, oh, I see what he's doing. Fifteen minutes ago, I wouldn't have seen it, but now I've seen it. See, because we collect knowledge by the journey. And so as we're watching him, we're like, oh, I see. And then when he's done, we see this beautiful picture, this masterpiece that we couldn't see before. God's painting a masterpiece. We can't see it. And we're in time. We're trying to figure out what God is doing, but we can't see the picture because we're way too close. If you build, if you paint a mural like this one that Oren painted, and you walk up to it and you say, what is that? This looks just like black and there's some, some orange in it. It's not until you back up. Even here, I, I, can't, I see your fingernail. And as I back up, see, some of you guys, you can see what it is right there. From where I was, I don't know what that is. And God, he is not in time. He's outside of time. And he can see the end from the beginning. And so he can see the beautiful picture, and here you are in pain. You are having issue, and God says, I'm using that to paint this beautiful masterpiece that you can't see. And so God, he makes everything beautiful in his time. So what do we need to do? We need to trust what God is doing. Because everything that's coming into your life right now, whether it's good, you're in good times, or you're in bad times right now, God's allowing it. And in the end, it will work out to be beautiful. But did you notice what he also said? Right after he said he makes things beautiful in his time, he says he's also set eternity in the human heart. What does he mean, eternity in the human heart? There's something in the heart of every human that tips us off that there is more to this life than what we see. We, all, we look around and say, this can't be everything that there is. Blaise Pascal has a quote when he was speaking about this where he said, there was once in man a true happiness of which there now remained to him only the mark an empty trace, which he tries to fill from all his surroundings, seeking from things absent the help he does not attain in things present. So he's taking from the things that he sees to try and fill that hole that he feels in his heart. And he says, but these are all inadequate because the infinite abyss that is in his heart, eternity, can only be filled by an infinite an immutable, that means doesn't change, object that, ha that is to say only by God himself. The 
abyss, the hole that's in our hearts, can only be filled by God himself. And so because of that, everything we try to fill with our lives to satisfy us, it doesn't. Remember, he went after wine, he went after laughter, he went after money, he went after women, right? He had 700 wives, 300 concubines. It was like, it's meaningless. And that's what people chase today. He went after learning, he went after wisdom. And at the end of it, he said, it's all meaningless. It didn't satisfy me. Why? Because eternity is in our hearts. Only God can fill and satisfy our hearts. And so... What is the issue here? The issue here, three problems that he's going to point out to us. And the first problem that we have is the problem of our pride. Look at again. He says in verse 11, he's made everything beautiful in his time. He's also set eternity in the human heart. No one, watch, no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. So what do I mean when I say the problem of pride? It says, no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to the end, meaning that the plans that God has, the picture that God is painting, we have no understanding of what he's doing because it's beyond our understanding. But somehow, our puny little minds, we think we can somehow understand. Somebody ever tell you, I know what God is doing. He shared with me his plans. I know why he allowed COVID to come into the world and wreck everything. You do. Really, God sat down. He shared with you what he's doing in the world. Even if he did. And he said, oh, Shalah, here here are the plans. Here you go. This is what I'm doing. And you looked at it and said, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know some of these words. Mm Mm-hmm. I got it. I got it. I got it. You ever say, I got it, and you don't? <laughs> you confused as Mike Tyson and Spelly Bee, you just listening to him, you're just like, I, I, don't, I don't understand what you're saying, but I already feel like people don't think I'm all that smart, so I'm not going to say anything. If God shows you the plans that he's doing, your mind would melt. There's no way to understand the plans of an infinite God. The secret things, Deuteronomy says, belong to the Lord. How in the world can you understand the plans of God? Families right now who are looking for loved ones under rubble in Haiti. You understand what God is doing there? Men, women, and children, Marines being killed by terrorists at an airport. How is that making things beautiful? You understand how that works? Somewhere along the way, I think we've forgotten that we are finite human beings. We are not God. And God, he doesn't answer to any of us. Because he knows what is from the beginning to the end. It reminds me, you remember Job? Job, he lost all of his wealth, he lost, his kids died, and it was all because Satan went to God and said, look, the only reason Job loves you is because you've given him a plush life, because he's been featured on lifestyles of the rich and famous, and he has all this wealth. That's why he loves you. He goes to church and he sings, hallelujah, God is so good. I have, I have lived in the goodness of God. The only reason he's singing that song is because you have given him everything. If you take all that stuff, he'll curse you. God said, okay, fine. So Satan took away his kids, all of his wealth, and eventually took his health, And he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. But as you read through the book, Job starts saying, well, hmm. And he starts getting a little salty. Him and his friends, they start discussing theology. And they off. (laughs) And he's talking, and he's off. 
And he's just kind of talking crazy, and God lets him. He's let him keep talking. Keep talking. Just go ahead. Get it all off your chest. Say it with your chest. And then in chapter 38, God starts talking. And he gives Job a verbal lashing. He said, you brace yourself like a man. I'm going to talk to you. And he starts question after question after question. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? No, no, no. I'm, I'm the student. You're the teacher. I'm going to sit here. You teach me. And he just, verse, when you go home, read Job chapter 38 all the way to, to 42 and just read how God, just question after question. Where were you? This is a paraphrase. Where did you, did you put up Saturn and Mars? You know how many hairs on your head? And by the end, in chapter 40, after all these questions, Job was like, my apologies. I didn't realize I was such an idiot. And I, I put my hand over my mouth. I, don't, I can't believe I would even say that. And then God said, no, no, I'm not done. And then for another two chapters, just lays into him. Where were you? By the end of it, Job's like, I don't know. I don't know. And by the end of it, Job, no. How dare me think that I can speak to the creator of the universe who knows everything from the beginning to the end. And in the end, God blesses Job and gives him everything that he lost and even, even more. Because in time, God does what is right. And beautiful. So the problem is our pride. Never think that, that, that God has to share with us what he's doing. Amen. Here's the second problem. The second problem is the problem with injustice. Look at verse 15. For whatever has already been and what will be has been before, and God will call the past to account. And I saw something else under the sun. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. In the place of justice, wickedness was there. I said to myself, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. So here's the problem. People say, well, if God is really sovereign in control, why is there injustice in the world? Why do we turn on our TVs and see the injustice? And it's happening in the place where it should be happening, which is the courts. He says that in the place of judgment and in the place of justice, that's the courts. How could you have injustice in the courts? Samuel Gross, the professor of um, law at the University of Michigan, he says, misconduct by police, prosecutors, and other law enforcement officials is a regular problem, and it produces a steady stream of convictions of innocent people. That is a terrifying statement. A steady stream of innocent people? I read of Robert Dubois, who this week was released from prison after 37 years for a rape and murder conviction that he did not do, and he was released after officials discovered new evidence that proved his innocence, and they found that a lot of times the reason they overturn these things is because of negligence and sometimes corruption. Reading of one judge, this judge, he was very harsh with people, and he put this single mom in jail for 496 days for failing to pay traffic tickets in Alabama. And in Alabama, that's more than what some, the maximum someone could get for negligent homicide. Now, negligent homicide, if you could intervene or do something, you see somebody fall off a cliff and you could call 911, you don't. There's less time for that than for what she did. Put her in jail, and so her kids had to be put into foster care. One of them was molested. The other one was physically abused. And this judge did over and over and over again, putting people into jail. So they brought him up on charges. He was convicted. They gave him 11 months off, no pay, and then allowed him to come back to the bench. 
And then not after that, he retired. You know how many people he probably put behind bars for things like that? It's, it's wrong. And on and on and on we can go. Some of you have stories of people that you know, things that you've gone through. So if, if God is really in control, how is it that he can allow injustice? And this is the answer that he gives. Just like there's a time for everything, in there he says, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked. There will be a time for every deed, a time to judge every deed. Nothing that happens in this world is going unnoticed by God. In the end of verse 15, it says, and God will call the past to account. The Hebrew there, it couldn't be translated as a way of saying like a shepherd that goes after a sheep that's wandered, that God, he can go back in time to deeds that have happened and bring them into the present. And in other words, there is no evil deed that will not have its day in court. God will at some point bring every evil deed to justice. So don't worry about God. He's not, he's not letting things go. He's not, he's not unaware of those things. But what's the last problem we have? The problem of death. Verse 18, I said to myself, as for humans, God test them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits both of them. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over the animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from the dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth? So what's the problem of death here? What he is not saying is that there's no difference between animals and human beings. Uh, animals do not have the same value as human beings. We all understand that. We all know that there's more value in a human baby than there is in a puppy, but that does not mean that we should be evil and should abuse them. In fact, God gives Adam and Eve the job of taking care of the animals. So I think people who do evil things to animals should be prosecuted. It's wrong. But there's, there's, let's not make a mistake in, in saying that human beings are the same as animals. Sorry, Peter. It's not the same. But he's not, he's not saying that. He's also not calling into question the afterlife. At the end, he says, who knows what might happen? He's not doing that because later on, he says, the human spirit goes to be with God. So if he's not saying that, what is he saying? He's simply saying this, that human beings and animals, they both end up in the same place. They both have death that's waiting for them. If you were to take a human corpse and the corpse of an animal, you wouldn't be able to say, well, that corpse of the human clearly had an advantage over the corpse of this animal because they both die and they both go to dust. And because that's true, human beings have no advantage. They have the same end as animals. And so they can't claim, well, there's something different about our death than there is about the death of everything else. But what we know in the New Testament, that for all who die in Christ, that we will be raised to new life. And God will give us new bodies, bodies that don't have issues. If you can't see right now, God will enable you to see in that day. If you have aches and pains, in that day you won't have aches and pains. You'll be able to walk, you'll be able to run, just like you could in high school. It's going to be the, the comeback. But we all have to pass through death. There is no advantage. Oh, we're human, so we don't have to pass through death. But God, in the New Testament, I have conquered death. Amen. So all these problems that he's pointing out, he answers, and the, the Scriptures give answers to. So if he's going to make everything beautiful in his time, <clears throat> we need to not have pride in our hearts we need to not worry about injustice or death because God's going to take care of those things in time. So we acknowledge the sovereignty of God in every season of life. But then what's the second point that he wants us to see? And the second one is one that he's made already. We need to enjoy the gifts of God in every season of life. Notice what he says there at the end. So I saw that there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work because that is their lot. For who can bring 
them to see what is done after them. And if you go back to verse 14, actually 13, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This is the gift of God. What is his answer to life under the sun in the world where we know eventually we're going to die? What are we going to do? We acknowledge the sovereignty of God in every season of life, and then what do we do? Enjoy his gifts. This is what he said last time. Remember, he said, just enjoy food. I said this last week, and a family, a couple families, they went out for sushi. And then they texted me the picture. They said, we love the message. (laughs) And my heart was so full. I said, this is exactly what I want us to do, to enjoy what God has given to us. We, me and my wife, we got a kid-free weekend. And we sat in the parking lot like, what are we going to do? We just sat there like, where do you want to go? I was like, I don't know. It's too hot outside. So what we, let's, just, let's just go. We just drove around Sonoma County and walked into stores and enjoyed each other's company, went into places we never ate before, got food, enjoyed a great movie. We just enjoyed life with no kids. And then today we're going to enjoy life with our kids. <laughs> and then we will enjoy life without the kids. God has given us these gifts. He's given us wine. He's given us laughter. He's given you your family. All these things. Listen, they're not a means to an end. I got to find purpose in me. No, just, just enjoy it. When I go to BJ's and I get a, a nice Shirley Temple, why oh, y'all laughing at my Shirley Temple? Y'all better stop laughing at my Shirley Temple. And I get all those cherries in it. I enjoy it. I don't think, what is the meaning of these cherries? And what, how does this add to the... I don't do that. You shouldn't do that either. Just enjoy the things God has given to you. Enjoy his gifts. Enjoy your family. Enjoy, walk outside. Enjoy son. Enjoy. Enjoy. They are gifts from God. It's how God intends intends for you to enjoy your life. But here's the issue that I think all of us have because we love the fact that there are good times, but what about the times that are not so good? There's a time for mourning. There's a time for laughter. We like the laughter, so how do we deal with the mourning? I think what he would say to us is endure. Endure. You remember what Job said to his wife right after all this happened? He said to her, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Here's what Job understood. The good things in life are from God. And some of the bad things that happen in life come through the hands of God. And that's hard to deal with. I'm not going to stand here and pretend that I know what you're going through and I know what you're feeling and because I have difficult times and days as well, things going on in my family, and it's not as easy. Just pick up the Bible, read a verse, pray, and it all goes away. No. I probably cry every couple days about things that are happening right now in my family. What am, I, what am I supposed to do? Endure. Our faith learns to live with inconsistencies and absurdities. That's what real faith helps us to live with. Just say, I don't understand that. I don't get that. But we don't live by explanations. We live by promises. Amen. So if today you are feeling the weight, the heaviness, the burden of something that's going on in your life, and it's hurting, and it's painful, endure. Because seasons change. 
Let me leave you with this quote from David Gibson. He says, if we could see the end from the beginning, we could see the end from the beginning <clears throat> and understand how a billion lives and a thousand generations and unspeakable sorrows and untold joys are all woven into a tapestry of perfect beauty, then we would be God. Not God. So, if you need to endure, endure. If you need to enjoy today, enjoy. Because we're not God. We need to just trust Him. Let's pray. Thank you for listening. If you would love to hear more sermons like this one or find out more about our church, please visit us at villagebaptisthome.org. Until next time, take care and God bless.